Perfect. Okay. So let me also start sharing my screen. And if you can also confirm that you can now see um, a slide just with the title of today's webinar. Great. Seems that technology is on uh, uh, on our side. So, okay. Um, thank you very much for joining. And uh, um, so let me open just this and this. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I see quite a few people um, already online. Thank you uh, for joining. So I suggest uh, we get started. So let me uh, just start by um, introducing myself. I'm Leonardo and I'm working for the UNOCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. So my team has been mainly working, um, you know, in support of the implementation of uh, anticipatory action um, uh, frameworks from uh, from OCHA, specifically with CERP, the Central Emergency Response Fund. And we have realized that, you know, there's a great interest at all levels, you know, within, you know, like the, the humanitarian sector in understanding and making use of climate data. So that's why, you know, we started last year with the first uh, climate data workshop in The Hague, and that's why we decided to organize just ahead of the uh, rainy season in, uh, 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 in West Africa, uh, today's webinar. So today is really like an informal uh, conversation. We have, we are lucky that we have experts from the UK Met Office that will help us uh, you know, navigate through some of the challenges when it comes to sort of like reading, interpreting and accessing uh, the, the forecast. So if you have questions, please use the chat. I see that people have already like uh, found where the chat is. So I see that um, quite a few messages uh, here. Um, Godfrey, can I ask you just to um, monitor the links in the chat and just jump in if there's anything uh, for us. Okay. Um, so, yeah, as I said, let's take this as an informal conversation, an opportunity to learn. Um, so let me then get started by quickly um, introducing the center. So the center is part of OCHA and we provide, you know, support around data. So you probably know the center because of HDX, the Humanitarian Data Exchange, we actually do more than uh, uh, you know making data available and maintaining the HDX platform. We have a data responsibility uh, work stream that really works you know on uh, supporting on all data uh, related issues. We have a, a, a data literacy program, and that's you know like part of this uh, work actually you know, around building capacity. And then there's my team, the data science team that really works, you know, more as sort of like helping you, my Italians, making use of uh, models, in this case, uh, climate models. The goal of the center is really to support the humanitarian community in, uh, you know, like making use, so to increase the use, but most importantly, the impact of data in humanitarian response. And that's really, you know, one of the goals of today's webinar. Um, I'm very lucky today um, to be uh, joined by uh, Stefan Lines, Stefan Lines, that is, you know, uh, will be our scientist on the call. So if you have any questions, you know, other things you never, you know, uh, dare to ask, you know, now you have a scientist and you can really like um, uh, ask uh, questions. So we have some um already like some slides for you there will be time for q a but let me you know right now leave the floor to stefan to introduce himself thank you so much leonardo and uh thank you to you and Ocha for the opportunity to to join this webinar um it's fantastic to be a part of of an event like this and i i hope you can all hear me loud and clear um I'll introduce myself. My name is uh, Stefan Lines, and I work at the Met Office in the UK. And within the Met Office specifically, I work within what's called the International Sub-Seasonal and Seasonal Outreach Team, which does a lot of work across mostly Africa and Asia in terms of building institutional capacity at places like National Met Services, 
and regional climate centers in the ability to produce and communicate seasonal forecasting information usually. Uh, I have a bit of a background as a climate scientist. When I joined the Met Office, I was involved in producing regional climate projections. So that's about taking large scale climate projections and applying them in a more local setting so that uh, stakeholders can better understand changes that might be expected over many years to decades. Uh, but more recently, I've been involved as a seasonal forecaster through projects such as the EU's CONFER project and the UK's uh, WISER project, which has been mostly uh, working with the regional climate centre ICPAC in East Africa. I'll just then, if we can move on the slide to just introduce a little bit about the Met Office itself. So the Met Office used to be situated in Reading, which is a town just outside of um, the capital London, but is now down in the southwest of the country in Exeter. And this is our new building, which you can see on the right hand side here. We're constantly changing our numbers, but at any given time, we're roughly about 1,900 staff strong and about 1,500 of those people sit at the headquarters in Exeter. We've got about 50 manned locations and many more unmanned observing sites as well. And just so that you can see what we do, about 35% of our workforce are in forecasting and observations, and 29% sit within science and research. So we are as much about the operational uh, providing of weather, seasonal and climate forecasts and projections as we are about actually developing the science and trying to better understand um, the climate and the world in which we live in. Thank you, Leonardo. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, I see a comment in the chat. Um, you should check just in the um, in the platform because you know it seems that other participants are able to see uh, the slides. I will also put the link um, in the um, in the chat so that you have the slides as uh, as reference. Okay, so thank you very much, Stefan. That's very exciting to have you here um, today. So let's then uh, get started so we don't have time for a round of introductions so i um i will ask you to just put a short message in the chat just introduce yourself you know the the organization uh, you're working for and eventually one of the things that you would like to learn today as part of this workshop then we'll go through and make sure we cover uh, you know all the different topics that you uh, highlight so that's the agenda for today. So we have prepared a little presentation just on uh, to introduce you to you know the, the world of precipitation forecasts. So there are of course different forecasts, different time scales, and so on. So Stefan will take us you know through um, you know the main uh, forecasts that are available, right? So and this will be more focusing on the science, right? Um, then, of course, you know, there, there will be time for uh, a Q&A. So if anything is unclear and so on, you know, at any point in time, just, you know, leave a message in the chat or, you know, just, you know, during the, uh, the Q&A. And then I think, you know, the second part is, you know, what it, you know, when it comes more practical. So we want then to give you some tools or, you know, like insights or suggestions on uh, how to read interpret and eventually act on the basis of uh, uh, the forecast that we'll be uh, describing in uh, uh, in the first part of uh, of the webinar so without um we also have some practical exercises so towards the end to really see you know how you know th th this could work in uh, in practice so without further ado let me leave the floor um for the first part to actually stefan that will talk us more broadly about, you know, uh, precipitation forecast. Over to you, Stefan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Leonardo. Okay, so we're going to start talking about precipitation forecasts in general. That's rainfall forecasts. And I think it's really good to start with making sure that we have a joint understanding of when we talk about rainfall forecasts, 
uh, they're quite different depending on what time scale that we're looking at. So let's first take a look at the kinds of forecasts that are available to us. And I should note that the terminology used here to describe the forecasts, they're words that we typically used in national meteorological organisations. So what they mean to us might be quite different to what they mean to you. For example, what we describe as long uh, may not be that long to you, for example. And scientists have worked for many years to produce forecasts that are useful from days to months and years ahead. And the true dream is to be able to have a seamless approach where we're able to look far into the future and get an understanding of what might happen. And then as we get closer to that point in time, we will have more certainty, certainty because those forecasts just inherently have more, uh, have more certainty in them. Um, we would say that they have better skill in being able to represent uh, what actually happens the closer that we get to that point. So each of these forecasts has a specific timescale of focus and it can be used to inform action ahead of a weather or climate event. And the shortest of these is the so-called short range forecasts, right? And that's typically what we're seeing when we're watching the weather forecast on the news or hearing it on the radio. Typically, we would be looking at these for about three days ahead with a focus on the sort of day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour changes in the weather. But it really could be anywhere from the next 30 minutes, which we sometimes call now casting, which is close as you can get to actually looking out of your window all the way out to about um, seven days. And these forecasts are extremely skillful at forecasting sudden onset events such as floods or heat waves or tropical cyclones. Now, following those, we've got these medium range forecasts, which again, typically look at around 10 days ahead um, and then extended range as well, which can look up to a month ahead. And some people may call extended range um, sub-seasonal forecasts. So you may have heard of sub-seasonal forecasts. Now, really importantly, these forecasts, they cannot, or I should rather say, they should not be used to inform any kind of hour by hour changes in the weather. They're more useful for looking at larger scale climate conditions, um, a rough idea as to whether, for example, we might expect a prolonged dry spell or an unsettled or wet spell. It can't tell us precisely exactly how much rainfall we're going to get on that day, 14 days or maybe two weeks ahead. And then we come on to the long range forecast. These are probably the ones you're most familiar with, but they're often the most challenging to interpret. We sometimes call them seasonal forecasts, typically looking anywhere between sort of two and six months ahead. And we're looking to predict the sort of average conditions that we might have over an upcoming season. So we want to know things like, will that season, will that period be slightly wetter or slightly drier or maybe hotter or cooler if we're talking about temperature than normal? And when we talk about normal, we often talk about a sort of 30 year period of time, sometimes called a climatology. So we want to know whether an upcoming season will be slightly different from those average conditions. Now, these long range forecasts can also include these forecasts of large scale climate drivers, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which you've probably heard of, otherwise known as ENSO. And last but not least, we have the climate projections. Notice that we change from calling them forecast to projections, and that's because with climate projections, we're looking at years and years ahead, decades, maybe even the end of century. And what happens on that time scale is very much dependent on a number of factors that are very difficult to predict, such as changes in our society and economics. So we call them projections because they're based on a number of different possible, plausible scenarios. Now, it's really important to note here that the decision making rarely ever depends on any one single one of these forecasts. Right. It's important to use them all together and to supplement forecasts or predictions with additional information as it becomes available. 
So if we move on now, Leonardo, and we're going to focus predominantly on the long range forecasting time scale of this sort of three to six months. And firstly, we should understand what makes these seasonal forecasts even possible to begin with. So many of you will likely have heard of the term ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the two events within it, the El Nino or La Nina. Um, but let's actually briefly discuss what these terms mean. So the El Nino Southern Oscillation is a semi-regular fluctuation in the sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific. And those surface ocean temperatures, they are directly coupled or linked to the atmosphere above it. Now, ENSO oscillates between two phases, the La Nina, and we've just experienced three consecutive La Ninas, which is very unusual, and El Nino. And as it transitions between the two, we'll enter a phase called um, the ENSO neutral phase. Now, El Nino is the warm phase, it's often called, because this means we have much warmer um, than normal sea surface temperatures in the East Tropical Pacific, and La Nina is the cooler phase with the sort of cold, deep ocean coming up in the East Tropical Pacific. And that's what we've just recently had. Next slide, please. So through these global circulation patterns, these circulation of our oceans, the circulation of our atmosphere, um, they're intricately linked to one another. And so it means that conditions that happen all the way in the tropical Pacific can impact climate conditions around the world, including Africa. Now, specifically for Africa, the typical impacts of El Nino and La Nina are shown here. So on the left, we've got the typical impacts of El Nino, and we can see that in July to September, we have over the Sahelian region, for example, a drier tendency and that reverses for La Nina. It's really important to state at this point though that not all ENSO events will result in these same impacts. That's really critical. So the map that you see here, it's based on historical observations. When we've had an El Nino, when we've had a La Nina, it has been drier or wetter, uh, depending on the season, for example but it doesn't always happen. There's a good chance that it will inform us of what's likely to happen, but it's not a dead certain or a guarantee at all. So while ENSO is understood to be like the most integral and the dominant driver often, other regional climate dynamics will interface with it and possibly even cancel it out. So you may have heard of oscillations like the Indian Ocean Dipole or the Madden Julian Oscillation, which is a eastwards uh, moving uh, area of intense convective rainfall that spans the globe in about sort of 30 to 60 days. So ENSO is only one thing that we should be looking at here. Now on the next slide, what we're showing is the Met Office's prediction for the state of the El Nino Southern Oscillation into the summer of 2023. It's actually showing the sea surface temperature anomaly so when I say anomaly, that's the difference in value from normal as a function of time. So we're going all the way from June to October and it's measuring the sea surface temperatures anomaly in one specific region of ocean, which we call Nino 3.4. And what you can see here is that from June to October, these anomaly values are ab about one degree or higher. And the threshold for defining an El Nino is 0 0.5, noting that typically we have to have these conditions for about three months before we officially declare an event. But we're expecting in June these El Nino conditions to develop and strengthen and maintain itself over um, this period of time. What you see here is the thick red line is the sort of average value that we're expecting. But as I'll mention in a minute, seasonal forecasts, and this information has come from a seasonal model, it, it, it's made up of many, many different individual forecasts. So one single overall forecast will contain many individual 
um, separate forecasts as well. And that's why when we talk about seasonal information, we always talk about probabilities. Because, for example, half of those individual forecasts, which we call ensemble members, may be above a certain value and the other half might not be. And we'll talk a little bit later about why there is so much uncertainty. And you can see here, the shading represents the range of possible solutions that we might expect. And we have a range of solutions in these seasonal forecasts. Okay. Next slide, please. So to visualize how a seasonal forecast works, let's pretend that we're forecasting for a fairly standard season and there are no large scale climate drivers at play, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation or the IOD. Now, the way that we're going to represent this is by what's called this Galton board. And the idea is you drop these balls in the top of the board. It will hit these pins in the middle and land at the bottom. And when it hits a pin, when a ball hits a pin, it can go left or right, and we have no idea which way it's going to go. And the fact that we don't know which way it's going to swing is meant to sort of represent the sort of chaotic nature of our weather systems. So due to this chaotic nature, we cannot accurately predict where that one ball is going to land. However, if we keep dropping those balls in, we'll build up a distribution and we'll find that many of those balls will land in the middle and a few will land on the left and the right. And that sort of represents our possible climate outcome. So we can have some that will be wet, some that will be dry and many that will fall in the middle. And this is exactly how weather and climate models work. They run a large number of separate forecasts to build up what we call an ensemble of forecasts to create a picture of the likely distribution of weather conditions. Again, it's not a guarantee, it's a probability of something happening. Now, next slide please. Let's say that we've got a strong driver of rainfall variability over Africa, such as an El Nino event. And that's happening in the tropical Pacific. What this effectively does is it tilts our forecast. This is what these large scale drivers do. They push our forecast and our distribution. We still can't predict exactly where one ball will land on its own, but we do have some idea that it's more likely to land now on the right hand side, maybe in the dry side, for example. So ENSO here is telling us something about the most likely conditions. They, they underlie the most predictable part of the seasonal prediction but they do not fully determine the season outcome. We must consider so many other drivers as well. Okay, next slide, please. So now let's talk about the uncertainty element of this quickly. And what we want to describe is that forecasts, as I mentioned earlier, they're made up of many, many separate individual forecasts. They run a large number of times for the same period of interest. So the Met Office's seasonal model, Glossy, for example, it will contain about 40 or more different forecasts for exactly the same period and location. We call it an ensemble, and the ensemble is used to better understand uncertainty in our forecasts. And there are two primary sources of uncertainty when it comes to seasonal forecasting. The first is that when we do, when we run our seasonal model out into the future, we have to start it from something that we know. That's the true state of the climate and the weather right now. And if I said to you, can you tell me exactly what the humidity, the wind speed, and the temperature is for every single location on the planet at any given time, that would be a challenge, right? We've got a whole array of rain gauges, thermometers, we've got satellites, but there's still going to be slight gaps in our ability to represent what's happening right now. And that's one level of uncertainty, that we don't actually know what is happening everywhere in our atmosphere, in our oceans at this given time. And that means when we evolve that model in time, it's going to pick up on those small errors and propagate them. The other thing is that the models are just simply imperfect. We've spent years researching and developing these models and we'll spend many more years doing so, but we're not necessarily at this point capturing all of the atmospheric processes, all of the ocean processes that describe the world in which we live in. 
So producing forecasts using ensembles allows us to identify probabilities of something occurring because it captures the fact that a model forecast may go one way or another because of all of these uncertainties. Next slide, please. So let's try to visualize just how this uncertainty actually manifests itself. So let's say that this green egg shape on the left represents the uncertainty in our initial state. That means our, our observations of the world right now. The shape of it, the size of it, is trying to capture the fact that we don't know the conditions everywhere on our planet at any given time. The orange egg on the right hand side, it represents the uncertainty in our future state. And that uncertainty is much larger because the model picks up on those initial uncertainties. And as we go forward in time, they grow and they grow and they grow. And that is why it is much harder to produce forecasts further out into the distance than it is to produce something in the next few days, for example. So the orange egg is the uncertainty in our future state and it includes the chaotic nature of our climate system. So if we run a single forecast, we can capture a small fraction of this future uncertainty. But if we then run another forecast, and that might be using um, a different model, which has different physics in it, or it might be a the same model, but using slightly different initial weather conditions, yeah? We will capture a different fraction of that future uncertainty. And we can build up a whole range of where we think we will be in the future. So what we often have, what we often end up in is a spread of possible solutions. We might expect the total seasonal rainfall to be between this value and that value. And we can say that there's a 50% chance or a 60% chance that the rainfall will be above this value or in an upper tercile. If you're familiar with tercils, we'll discuss that later. But really importantly, it doesn't quite define every possible solution. So even though it can give us the most likely outcome and probabilities and a range of values because of that uncertainty, there it's still possible that the true solution will lie outside of those, um, those values. And that's what makes seasonal forecasting so challenging. I think it's back to you now, Leonardo. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely. So, and just as a reminder, if you have questions, we have, you know, a moment like to slow down, um, you know, shortly. And then if you have questions, just put them uh, in the chat for uh, Stefan. Okay. So, um, by now, you know, we have some elements. We understood sort of like what makes forecasts available, what are the different types of forecasts. So let's quickly look at who's producing this forecast. So where can you find um, this information? So, and of course, I mean, you have, you know, multiple options. Um, so let's quickly review, you know, the main actors actually producing this, uh, uh, this type of information. So first of all, and this is a, a map that we took from uh, um, uh, the WMO, uh, the World Meteorological Organization Lead Center, there are global producing centers. So um, centers there are, and you see that uh, uh, the UK uh, Met Office is actually there. So there are centers actually uh, producing, um, you know, at the global level, uh, forecast really like across the globe. So these are, you know, the, the, the main models that are used and they cover large areas. So they are mainly, these actors are mainly responsible for, uh, you know, generating these ensemble forecasts, you know, and seasonal forecasts that uh, Stefan uh, just described. For those that are sort of like, you know, receiving updates and are uh, uh, especially in uh, uh, in your region, you know, you also know that there are uh, climate outlook forums. So, but, and, you know, they also provide bulletins mainly, you know, at the regional level based on uh, consensus um, among, you know, the different actors, for instance, for uh, uh, West Africa is the PRESSAS. 
uh, maybe. So, and so what you get actually from this type of uh, actors are really more like bulletins specifically for a season. So the, you know, the latest actually updates from the process has just been released and we actually have an example uh, later on. And then, um, of course, there's a role for national uh, Met offices. So these are mainly, you know, at the country level, you know, included, you know, as part of the government and they produce forecasts at different types. I just put there an example uh, for, uh, uh, for Guatemala, for instance. Uh, of you know some information that is uh, available uh, there. So there are you know let's stop for a moment you know for questions, and uh, if not we have you know time if you're still thinking sort of like about sort of like the the, the questions you may have. I'll keep monitoring the chat. We'll continue for now because I don't see questions in the chat, and but we will stop you know in uh, um, in a moment answer your questions. So before, you know, as we continue, let's clarify, you know, some key terminology around forecast. And especially, you know, when we talk about some of these products, there are, there's, you know, there's a jargon and there are key terms that need to be uh, defined. So let's start really by talking about what we mean by, first of all, you know, what is the issue time right or the base time of a forecast and this is actually the time when the forecast is released so let's take an example in uh, may the uk med office produces you know the seasonal forecast for the rainy season july august september so the base time in this case would be may that is telling us sort of like when you know, all the models that Stefan described, you know, run and, and the analysis was actually performed. The key term is actually the forecast lead time. So, and it's really like the time between the, the, the period that we are, you know, like projecting. So, um, and in this case would be July, August, September and the base time. So really like, what is the gap? How far in the, into the future? are we uh, providing projections for? And then there's the target period that can be different. Imagine a forecast that is produced for, you know, uh, three months, that would be the July, August, September, or a forecast that is just July. So that's really like the window uh, that we are, um, that we are, you know, uh, producing uh, forecasts for. So related to this, there are two key concepts to keep in mind. One is um, the concept of, I mean, resolution, right? So resolution can be both temporal resolution and spatial resolution. So typically when we talk about temporal resolution, it's really like the smallest, the shortest unit of time for which the forecast is produced. Going back to my uh, previous example, the a forecast that is, you know, like produce and, you know, the information is available for a three months period as a resolution of three months. The other forecast that, you know, at all, was only produced for the month of July would have one month resolution. And, you know, already in the description made before, you understand that different forecasts have different resolutions. So a forecast that is produced, you know, for a week would never be able to tell you, you sort of like what is happening, you know, in the next hour or in the next day, but it's just providing information on what is happening on average during the, you know, during the, uh, the target time. So, um, and I see questions actually coming in the chat. So yeah, great. We'll get back um, to, uh, to that in a moment. The second concept is the spatial resolution which is very similar to the temporal resolution, but it's just, you know, the geographical area um, that, is, that is covered. And this is really like the smallest unit of space for which we can consider the forecast accurate and we can use the forecast. So, yeah, these are two key uh, concepts that, you know, we would like you to keep in mind, you know, as already like described before, as we get closer to the actual target period, as we have forecasts producing, you know, sort of more like, you know, 
granular information, that means that the tempo, both the temporal and the spatial resolution, they tend to go together, meaning a forecast that is produced sort of like, you know, for the next two days at an hourly base tend to have, you know, a spatial resolution that is very granular. So meaning that it can be very specific. While a forecast that is produced for the rainy season starting in three months will have, of course, a temporal resolution that is much coarser, meaning, you know, like monthly or even like three months. And, you know, together with this, a spatial resolution. So, and we'll get to also like a practical example of what this resolution really implies, you know, in your decision making and in the interpretation of the forecast um, in a moment. Okay, so maybe let's take this, uh, you know, we have two questions in the chat. I don't know, Stefan, if you have been able to uh, read them. So let's go back to the Q&A. We address these two questions and then we continue with, uh, uh, with the rest. So the first, so let me just go here. So the first question would be um, around ENSO. So the question is, um, if this was, you know, something just to illustrate the theory and, you know, how we produce forecasts, on, or this is really like the main phenomenon that is impacting the forecast in uh, uh, Western and Central Africa. Um, if that's not the case, what are some of the other factors to keep in mind? Um, the second question may be related to this um, is really on uh, more like the, the climate uh, uh, predictions, meaning, you know, how all these relate to climate change? Is there a way to you know, forecast the impact of climate change on weather phenomena. And now, uh, thanks Barnaby for this question. So the, the, let's get the third one that is more, um, you know, on, around sort of like relation to humanitarian indicators. So let's focus on these two first. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for those questions. Um, I think they're really important. So uh, yeah, certainly lots of lots of focus on ENSO, and uh, there's almost uh, almost a little bit of ENSO hysteria at the moment, particularly in the media. And I I think that's because we've just experienced this triple dip La Nina, and just having a shift is is generating interest. This is a natural phenomenon, yes, and it it oscillates, um, you know, semi regularly. We, absolutely expect there to be an El Nino at some point. I think there is a lot of interest because there seems to be a very high certainty in this case that there will, will be an El Nino developing quite uh, rapidly. And there are some indications that it will be sort of moderate um, to strong as well. I think uh, for West Africa is a really good point. I think we know that there is historically a strong link between the El Nino Southern Oscillation and conditions over this region, and we should be paying attention to what is happening and what the sort of direction that this may push um, uh, the sort of seasonal forecast in. But it's absolutely true um, that it is in part, you know, to sort of illustrate the theory because it's just one of many climate drivers that will have an effect in the region, right? It's probably one of the most important, um, but we do also have to, um, you know, assess the situation with the uh, the movement of the intertropical convergence zone, which uh, will itself sort of um, implicate whether a, a rainfall season will be um, early perhaps or delayed. Uh, we have other drivers that may have an effect, but not so much, such as the Indian Ocean Dipole. One example is uh, we often talk about seasonal drivers, but there are also these drivers of rainfall variability that occur on what we call these sub-seasonal timescales. So sort of uh, two weeks to, to one month in advance. And the Madden-Julian oscillation is, is incredibly important. It's this sort of eastwards propagating area of um, enhanced, in some cases, suppressed rainfall. And it is almost exclusively the main reason why in East Africa, for the last season, uh, the seasonal forecast was issuing drier than normal. And we had a very potent MJO that led to extreme rainfall. In fact, in Ethiopia, um, we, we sort of exceeded 
um, historical records by two to three times. So even though all of the seasonal drivers and our seasonal understanding was pushing it in one way, something like the MJO, the Madden Julian oscillation that happens on shorter timescales can come in and change that. So it's, it's really important to make sure that we're aware of what the key drivers are and what their status is. Um, and I think we can use ENSO in addition to seasonal forecasts, just like we can look at the state of the MJO when we look at sort of sub-seasonal or monthly forecasts or the extended range forecasts, for example. So that's really important. On the second question, how do we relate all of this to climate change? And is there a way of forecasting its impact on weather phenomena? I think this is absolutely critical, right? Because in some cases, some areas that we might be working in um, the, the sort of skill, the ability to provide accurate and useful seasonal information is limited. That's unfortunate, but is often the case. And so we may sometimes want to look at climate change projections as a way of better understanding what those extremes might be. So we might have to say we're quite uncertain of what direction a rainfall forecast is going. You know, it you know, we've got some idea that it might be slightly wetter or slightly drier, but actually the climate projections may be telling us things about the likelihood of there being a very extreme precipitation event, you know, what, what those bounds are on, on what you might expect. So climate change will, of course, um, alter the, uh, the, the temperature and the rainfall dynamics over the region. There will be a lot of there's a lot of certainty in which direction the temperature is going, of course, but in rainfall, there's a lot of uncertainty there as well. But it may give us some clues as to, OK, you know, sort of five years in the future, when we talk about historical years where we've had very extreme rainfall, might we expect that, might we expect even sort of more extremes in, in the future? So I think it's really important to blend that climate change information with seasonal information, with sub-seasonal. So you can use that climate change to plan ahead, to see how those extremes might change, look at the seasonal forecast to see what direction it might be going in, blending it with that climate change information, and then we use our sub-seasonal or extended range and medium range weather forecast to really start taking um, immediate action at that point. Thanks, that was really clear. So on the third one, the third question is, so how this weather information specifically and so may relate to uh, humanitarian impacts, right? And events that may, um, you know, uh, generate, you know, in, or make humanitarian needs worse in, uh, uh, in this region, meaning, you know, would increase the risk of floods or, you know, loss of, you know, uh, crops and so on. So. Um, maybe I can make a comment uh, on this, and I let you then uh, uh, step in, Stefan, if you if you want to compliment. So, especially for you know at the level of you might have an actors, that's the main challenge, really, like trying to understand how do we go from understanding the weather patterns and you know what the weather will be, and you know get a better understanding of what the weather will do. So, how do we? go from sort of like the weather forecast to an impact forecast. So within, you know, like uh, different humanitarian, you know, agencies have developed quite, you know, like you know, more and more analytical tools and there's a more and more, you know, like a, a better understanding of the correlation between external factors like, you know, such as, you know, weather or overall uh, amount of rain receiving the rain, the rain season and eventually impact indicators which could be i don't know number of people impacted by floods or uh, you know ipc or car harmonize uh, data and so on so this has been actually the main basis i mean this type of correlation and, and analysis for you know the implementation of anticipatory action that is actually based on a projected risk of humanitarian needs. So specifically with ENSO, you um, probably you know that within the interagency standing committee, we even have uh, an ENSO analysis cell. So that is really like taking all partners together, looking at sort of like this long range 
you know, trends suggested by, you know, these global uh, factors and looking at what, what could be sort of like the implications uh, at the level of the operations. Even in that case, so as Stefan said, specifically for Enzo, I think, you know, this is giving a, an indication of sort of like in which direction we may be going in the in the future, right? So if it's, you know, towards more like dry or wet conditions, but it's not, you know, defining the actual outcome. So it's probably, you know, based on ENSO information, a good time to just make sure that we are ready for this, you know, scenario that is still pretty much sort of like far away. But then as we get closer, for instance, you know, to the rainy season, always complement with the available um, information. And I'm glad actually to see this question because we have, an, you know, a question specifically on uh, uh, ENSO versus seasonal later on. So thank you so much. Don't be shy. If you have other questions, just put them in the chat. Let me go back to the presentation then. So we have just a few slides on uh, um, the actual output of the uh, of the forecast. So let me leave it to you, Stefan, to present these uh, uh, next few slides, and then we can dive into more like the practical exercises. Thanks. Thanks so much, Leonardo. Okay, so let's have a little discussion now about the forecast data output, because I think it's really important to look at this. And the reason why is because when we actually go and look at our forecast information, it's often presented in a number of different formats. And sometimes um, that information isn't necessarily um, useful for a particular use case. So we need to be aware of the sort of common types of um, methodologies for communicating that information. So if we go to the next slide, one of the ways that we can communicate information, I think this is probably more likely uh, a sort of image that you would see if you were looking at short range or maybe medium range forecast information is total rainfall. So what we're seeing here is the output from a model called CHIRPS um, GEFS, and it's actually showing the total rainfall in millimeters that we would expect to receive at any given location over a five day period. Now, in some cases, that might be very useful indeed. It might be that a particular um, actor in a region has much need for knowing precisely how much rainfall is to be expected in a given location over that certain period. And of course, we should be really careful here because that sort of information should really only be perhaps trusted in these short range forecasts where we actually are um, modeling the true weather patterns and what's actually expected, not sort of uh, extended range and seasonal where we're just talking about trends. The problem is, for example, that uh, if we look here in, say, Ethiopia, we may have uh, sort of 50 to 75 millimetres falling over that five-day period in that location. Now, to some people, that might be very useful, but for others, it might not mean anything. If you're not familiar with the sort of baseline rainfall that you would expect over that period. And for that reason, it's very common to express rainfall forecasts in terms of anomalies. So on the next slide, we will see an example. Again, this is from the Horn of Africa. Most of my work is um, in this region at the moment. Uh, and I think we discussed anomalies before, but just to recap, when we talk about an anomaly, it's not really saying that it's, it, it's odd and unexpected in terms of that kind of anomaly, but it is a value that differs from normal. And I think it's really important when you see a forecast and it's giving you an anomaly, always ask the question, what is it different to? So this map here is showing the seasonal, so the total amount, the, the difference in the total amount of rainfall over a season compared to what? And we see at the bottom here that it says, um, that it's the anomaly compared to the 1981 to 2010 average. 
So for example, in Southern Kenya here, they are expecting over this October, November and December period for 2022 to receive about 100 to 200 millimetres in total less than what would typically be received over the 1981 to 2010 period. So when you see anomalies, just be really careful to understand what it's in reference to. And the reason that that is important as well is because of climate change. And it's very important to make sure that we produce or we use forecasts that have up to date um, reference periods. So for example, 1981 to 2010, that was a very different world now. And that's that's why often you'll see anomaly forecasts that are 1991 to 2020. But this is very useful because I can look at this region with no understanding of what the typical rainfall patterns are in this region, but very clearly get an understanding of whether this location is going to be wetter or drier, or at least the likelihood of it being wetter or drier, without any understanding of what's actually happening there. Of course, you then have to know the true rainfall or the true expected rainfall over that 1981 to 2010 period to understand what the total rainfalls are. So you might want the total rainfalls, you might want the, 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 the sort of raw millimeter information, or you might want it in anomalies. The choice is up to you. Next slide, please. But because we're often talking about seasonal rainfall here, we have information on likelihoods and probabilities. And that's why when you see a seasonal forecast, you almost always see it. It's not a definitive. You can see other kinds of uh, information like anomalies, but you will almost always see the output in tersiles. Now, tersiles are both very useful, but also sometimes very difficult to understand. They're meant to be quite simple, but they're actually very complicated to interpret often. And that's because the information that you see tries to push you into interpreting it one way. So what I want to give you an example of, what we have here is the output from the regional forecast for uh, Southern Asia. It's coming out of the Climate Outlook Forum. And what you can see over the sort of right and northern part of India here is that we've got this orange color. It's saying that we've got a 35, perhaps to 40% chance of it being below norm normal. If we just look at the key without any understanding of what's happening here, it's telling us there's a 35 to 40% chance of below normal. So you instantly think, ah, okay, this region is going to be dry. But what it's actually telling us it's got that color because that is the category. So we have three categories, below normal, normal, and above normal. That is the category with the highest probability. But that probability may still only be, in this case, right, 40%. So there's a 40% chance that it's going to be dry in that region. And you see the orange and you, and you see dry. But actually, 40% is telling you that there's a 60% chance that all the other forecasts within that ensemble are not below normal. So they're actually either normal or above normal. So we have to be really, really careful. And this is one of the things about seasonal forecasts. They only usually a slight push in one direction or another, a slight trend towards one another, but it's not a very strong probability. We're not saying here that there's an 80% chance that it's going to be dry. It's only a very slight shift in what we might have as our baseline. And the reason I say baseline now is because that's how Stefan, we lost you. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you anymore, Stefan. Is it just me that I lost him? Yeah, so let's see if you're back. Am I back? Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. We lost you for like just 10, 10 seconds. I'm so. very sorry. I thought, <laughs> excellent, wonderful. Okay, so I'm just going to say again, okay? I'm going to tell you exactly what happens with the seasonal forecasting model. What we'll really do, we won't just produce a forecast. 
but we'll produce what's called a hindcast, or sometimes called a historical forecast, or sometimes called a retrospective forecast. And that's when we go back in time, maybe all the way back to 1980, and produce forecasts for every single season back in time. And we can build up a whole sort of 30 year period of these historical forecasts. And we then split all of those seasonal forecasts into three, three equal sections. So 33% of those forecasts will be what we call below average, 33 will be normal and 33 will be above. Then when we produce the actual forecast into the future, that will tell us where that fits within below average or normal. So when we produce the forecast, it is in relation to what that model has historically told us. So a TERSO is a way of categorizing data by dividing it into three equally likely categories. And for seasonal forecasts, that's usually below normal, near normal and above normal. And I think it's really important to state at this time that you may also come across other ways of expressing it, such as quintiles, where you may have um, very wet, wet, normal, dry and very dry. So there's different ways that you can split up the data, but it's very often into three parts. And as I mentioned, tercel categories, they have a baseline probability of 33%. And by definition, that means that on average, you would expect wet, dry and normal to occur once in every three years. So when we produce a seasonal forecast, it's just a way of telling us whether it's slightly more likely that we have a wetter or drier or normal conditions. And I think back to you, Leonardo. Yes, we actually have time for questions and there's actually one um, uh, that we can take now. So the question would be um, related to rainfall anomalies. So which range of anomalies do we need to be alerted? So basically what is relevant, right? For, you know, at the level of, you know, humanitarian, you know, operations. So when we should worry about. So is there like a range of anomalies that are considered more like extreme? I don't know if you want to uh, get started with this. I think I think that's a really, really good question. And I, I, I think that's why it's so important that uh, weather and climate information producers work closely with uh, the humanitarian sector, to work really closely with sectoral stakeholders on the ground to really co-explore and define what that information really means to you or that sector. Because it's absolutely true that very slightly higher values of expected rainfall for one sector or for one person or for one region might be very different from another. And so it's so important that we really get to grips with blending that climate information with on the ground vulnerability information, for example. So in one location for a particular group of people, 20 millimeters more rainfall over a season it might mean the difference between being flooded and having to be evacuated from that region or not. But for other regions, it might mean absolutely nothing at all. It might be 300 millimetres of rainfall before you start having a problems. So I think it's really critical that we both define, uh, you know, what, what the likelihood, what the probabilities are of something happening, but then also how impactful is that to a particular region, to a particular people, to a particular sector? And that has to be a joint exploration between climate information producers and people on the ground. Yeah, thanks. And maybe I can just add that unfortunately, well, as Stefan was saying, it, it is very context specific. To give you an example, we have been implementing um, anticipatory action for floods. And I see also a question specifically on floods. I'll, I'll get to that in a, um, in a moment. So um, in two different locations, right? So one is in the Jamuna River, so basically in Bangladesh, so big river basin. And now we are implementing what we can do in, in Yemen. 
right? So the, the, the type of anomaly that is actually related, you know, that is correlated with impact is slightly different, right? So in the case of a big river basin, we have been looking at more like accumulation over a 10 day period, because then, you know, there's a, this increase in the stream flow of the big rivers that are actually then overflowing and flooding, you know, the uh, areas around. In the case of Yemen, even, I mean, because there are basically no permanent rivers in, uh, uh, in that region, even like a, an accumulation over two days or three days of, you know, above a given like number of millimeters in three days, just because, you know, the ground is so dry and cannot really absorb this, you know, sudden amount of water that is falling could be related to a different type of flood. So he, in this case, we're talking about, you know, uh, flash flood. So it is very context specific. And that's where actually these analyses, this, you know, um, uh, Stefan mentioned the idea of kind casting, but that's exactly what we do when we try to correlate, correlate weather with impact. So we would look at what were the weather path, the weather patterns in the past, you know, few years. We look at historical data. What was the impact recorded on the ground? And so where do we see like a connection between the two? So it, it it's really like, um, you know, very much context specific. It could also depend on uh, the underlying vulnerabilities, right, of the of the locations that we um, that we are targeting. Um, the question of floods, yes, I mean, specifically for riverine floods, there are models that actually do that, right? So, oh, and by the way, this is a uh, just a, a good reminder that there will be another workshop like this one on the 20th at this, uh, of June at the same time on flood forecasting because we wanted to cover these two main shocks one that is more like you know rainfall and but the other one would be more on floods so there are hydrological models that are, that actually do exactly what is described in the uh, in the chat so basically looking at the rainfall and then the accumulation in the given you know catchment areas and then there's actually a model that predicts how many cubic meters per second will flow at a given, you know, uh, station or a given point of a river and what is the likelihood of this actually overflowing. So this will be covered actually, um, you know, in the um, in 20 days. So yeah, sign up if you haven't received I, I may also like um, send uh, the link to everyone if you're interested. Okay. Um, Anything to add from your end, Stefan, at this stage? Or can we move to the next part? Um, yeah, please go ahead, Leonardo. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Now we want to test something. So we, you have been listening a lot. Now we want you to be uh, more like, yeah, to take more uh, uh, an active part uh, in this. So we have um, actually to, to really like embed you in the decision making process. We have designed, you know, a little game, a little scenario for you. So for a moment, forget where you are and uh, let me welcome you to climate land. So climate land is um, an hypothetical uh, country. So climate land is um, a country that, um, you know, over time has, you know, experienced a consistent increase in both temperature and uh, a decrease in uh, uh, in rainfall. So that's, you know, like uh, likely the case in some of the countries you are uh, working in. So in the, in, you know, in the past few seasons, climate land has received, uh, you know, like has experienced drought, but also floods because, you know, the rainfall is becoming more and more variable during the rainy season. And, you know, the two rainy seasons have, have actually been below average. Now, the scenario is that imagine that now you are the new uh, climate data focal point in, uh, in climate land. And so at given moments in time, we will ask you to sort of like try to interpret the information that you are receiving at different moments in time, you know, in order to advise partners on, you know, like emergency preparedness and what should be done and sort of what are the key takeaways for the upcoming season. And yet the season, the rainy season in climate land goes, you know, between end of June, July to September. 
Now, you have uh, listened to this workshop, you have received, uh, you know, like, uh, and so prediction. So uh, that's the first element that you add on. Uh, so what is likely to happen on uh, climate change? So just as a reminder on uh, ENSO prediction, so this, you know, usually comes from, you know, global centers. The lead time is three to six, sometimes even a little more than six months ahead. And you have seen, you know, it, this was already described that it tends to have, you know, a high level of uncertainty because it's not the only factor, because it's projecting far in the future and for the other uh, reasons that we have uh, um, that we have described, and also keep in mind that you know we should be careful, especially with ENSO predictions, that not to you know overinterpreting this this forecast, right? So still, like even with the same ENSO conditions, because there are so many other factors, you can have different outcomes at the level of the actual season. So yeah, so the season is in July through September. Let me switch to the next one. And now towards the end of February or beginning of March, you start receiving, you know, uh, updates, right? So, and specifically for climate land, um, uh, El Nino, so that is the warm phase, typically, you know, is associated with dry conditions, while La Nina, that is the cool phase, typically actually is, um, uh, related to wet conditions in, uh, in this region. And now you get a forecast for Enzo. Can you, Stefan, can I ask you to help us interpret this graph? What does it mean? So this is a plot from the Met Office's seasonal model, which is called Glossy. And what it is showing is the range in forecasts, and I say range because we discussed how a seasonal forecast is made up of an ensemble of forecast members, um, for sea surface temperature anomalies, so the difference from normal, in a very specific region of the Pacific Ocean called Nino 3.4. And when the SST or sea surface temperature anomaly is greater than 0 0.5, we typically define that as an El Nino event. If it's less than minus 0 0.5, then it would be a La Nina. So what this is showing in the, the thick red line is the forecast mean. So it's just the average of all the forecasts. So it's telling you the average value of the anomaly in the Nino 3.4 region. And then the shading is telling us about the percentage, the number of the forecast ensemble members that are within that range, because we said how there's so much uncertainty in the forecast, each individual forecast on member will give you a little bit of a different value. The shading that you can see is 90% of all values. So 90% of all the forecast solutions are within that shaded area. And simply what it is showing is that we are expecting an El Nino, huh? over this period of time with high confidence. So first bit of information in climate land, um, there's a tendency towards El Nino. And as a reminder, El Nino is associated to dry conditions in climate land. That's what we would like you to keep in mind. That's what you get from, you know, the answer forecast, but then you start receiving also like the seasonal forecast, right? Just as a reminder, I'll keep it there for a moment, but what are seasonal forecasts and what are not seasonal forecasts? So, first of all, you can have information about, you know, the average conditions over the season, but not on a day by day level. So this, you know, brings back the concept of temporal uh, resolution. The forecast is always, you know, oftentimes available over a large region, but without really like being able to predict, you know, like small scale details uh, on the ground. So that's more like the spatial resolution and it provides a probability. So you have this shift in the probability distribution that is uh, forecasted and it's not really like predicting, you know, the millimeters of rain or well, uh, the, the temperature in the case of um, temperature forecast. Now, 
you have seen, you have probably seen, or most of you, this uh, update uh, for the upcoming season, actually, in, uh, uh, in you know, from presses. So, and just for this exercise, let's imagine that, you know, climate land is corresponds to Niger. You see in the timeline, roughly, the, you know, the time when you start receiving, you know, and so forecast and when you start, you know, receiving the seasonal forecast. So now the question for you, and then let me go to the next slide is, um, oh, let me stop for a moment and maybe let's interpret together this graph. So basically what you see is that this is, first of all, a terside forecast and the three numbers that you see on each region correspond to the probability of above normal, that's the, the number that you see at the top, below normal and uh, normal and below normal, the number at the at the bottom. So you see that this band that actually you know goes across the region, the the dominant pair side, you know, specifically there is, you know, above normal and then the light, uh, you know, and that's the dark gray. And then the light gray is more, you, you know, is pointing more towards a normal or, you know, above normal um, uh, season. So now the question would be, how do you bring together, sorry, I don't know why I went backward. How do you bring together the information that you get from El Nino forecast, basically saying that this will be dry July to September and this more like seasonal forecast. So I'm actually, so if you look at the chat, I'm actually opening a poll right now with some questions for you, the questions you see in the chat, and then we'll have time to comment uh, your answers um, uh, together. So let me see if again technology is on our side so you should be able to see now in the webex platform um uh, a poll um tab opening or active can you confirm if you can um, if you can see it and you have three questions so again you're the climate data focal points um Yes, I can write numbers for uh, for the press uh, update um, in the chat. I'll do it in a moment. I, okay, so the first question would be, based on what you have heard today, can you provide an answer on whether your climate land, in this case Niger, is likely to receive above, below, or you know normal rain for um, the upcoming season? The second question, and we'll, I'll leave you a bit of time to think, you know, to answer, will be, does, you know, the darker color on the map, you know, we were comparing, you know, the light gray with the dark gray, mean that uh, the rainfall will be significantly above average? So basically the question is, does the darker color means more rain? or not, and you will see the options that you um, that you have. I see people are actually, you know, starting filling out the, the poll. So if you cannot find it, so if you look at the, um, the you know, the WebEx platform, you should be able to find the polling uh, tab. And then the third question would be, can you just, you know, draft one sentence? <clears throat> what is your main takeaway? What, you know, if you were to uh, provide, you know, one talking point to, um, you know, um, the emergency preparedness group, what would be sort of like the main takeaway based on the information that you have available at this stage? I'm writing now the numbers. So the dark green on the map on the right as um, 45, for above 35 for normal and 20 for below normal. And the light green 
is 35 for above, 45 for below, and 20 for, um, sorry, 45 for normal and 20 for below. So yeah, let me, you know, I'll leave you just, you know, a couple of minutes um, to, uh, to answer the questions and then I'll close the poll and we can uh, um, together comment the, um, the, the outcome. Perfect. I see already quite a few people are done. So let me close the poll. Yes, in a minute it will be closing. So we have already 12 people that completed the, the survey. Sorry, I, I forgot that. Well, I assume that. Well, on this map, everyone can. Sorry, my bad. Can place. Um, Niger. Let me. Let's see if I can annotate the slide. Yeah, the, the poll is closing. Okay. Um. So I'm sharing in the chat the results. Let's see. So, but yeah, so let me just read the answers. So, and maybe Stefan, we can comment together. Um, so, is Niger likely to receive above, near normal, or below, or we cannot really say? The majority of people said, you know, around near normal. Um, quite a few people, like, you know, like uh, said above normal. And two people um, actually said that you know it's not we don't have enough information to say you know what the it will be. What is interesting is that nobody actually said that the the, the rainfall will be below normal. What would be your answer? Is that a question for me, Leonardo? Yes. <laughs> what would be the yes. Well, I think this is a this is a great example, right, of of how it can be very difficult to combine two sources of information, because this is a a case where the developing El Nino and looking at the map of historical impacts, we might expect to have drier than normal conditions, but with the seasonal forecast output, what we're getting is an enhanced probability for above average precipitation. So they seem to be contradicting one another. So we've got a number of people here that might be siding more with the uh, the dynamical models. And I think some have put near normal because we're sort of balancing out the ENSO with the, with the sort of uh, um, seasonal forecast output as well. I think the, out, the actual answer is very, very sort of tricky. But what I would say is that the, the seasonal forecast on the right hand side, it should be capturing both what's happening with the El Nino, but also 
as we discussed earlier from the chat question, um, far more than just El Nino. So El Nino is just one part of what's happening for that region. And typically that would, that would lead to drier conditions. But actually there's so many other things that we need to factor in. The incredibly warm temperatures in the North Atlantic, the Indian Ocean Dipole, the Madden Julian Oscillation. And then there's all sorts of things happening in the stratosphere. We've got volcanic eruptions. All of these things actually impact what's happening. So really it would be a this is a challenging one to interpret because we've got some contradicting information but you would probably tend to side with the seasonal outlook a little bit more in this case because it should be blending more of those drivers of rainfall variability in the region so i would tend to go with sort of above average or above normal but you could say sort of like above to normal in this case i think what would you say Leonardo? Thanks. That would be also, yeah, normal to, you know, between normal and above normal. Then the other thing, you know, I would do personally would be maybe to look at other data providers and see if other forecasts, there's actually a convergence, you know, like between the different forecast providers on this, you know, likely outcome that is, you know, you know, towards normal or, you know, like um, above normal. Also, because if you look at the light, uh, uh, um, green band is true that, you know, the dominant one is, you know, near normal uh, outcomes, but then, you know, the, the probability for above normal is still pretty high, right? So, and that's significantly higher than the, uh, the below normal probability that is only 20. So I would actually sort of like place my, my bet towards your normal or above normal, given this information. We just need to speed up a little bit. Um, so the question, well, actually, the, that, that's what we wanted to get out of. The, the second question is, you know, and I'm posing the question straight to you, uh, Stefan. Do you, does the darker color on a map for terror size means more rain or not? No, not on a terracile map, it wouldn't. So what's really important if you want to know the probabilities of it being significantly wetter, for example, rather than just in the above average, you would have to go back and look at more information such as the rainfall anomalies. Because what the terracile is just telling you is that it's in that upper third. And actually, if you went into detail and looked at it, you might see that it's only just about in that definition of above average, for example. So the, prob the, the number that it's giving is the probability that it will be in that category. So the likelihood that it will be in that category of above average, but it doesn't say anything specifically about just how above average it is, okay? So that's why we talked about the importance of using anomalies just to see how different it is from normal. Thanks. I think that's very clear. That's one of the key takeaway for, for you all, I hope. So when you look, when you interpret a terracile map, keep in mind that, you know, like that color represents, you know, the probability of the dominant terracile, not the amount of rain. So that's something, you know, very important to keep in mind. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, um, so I would like still to try, you know, very quickly to go through some of the use cases, and this can be um, can be very quick. Just type in the chat what is the forecast that you would use in this, you know, like different scenarios. Let's do it really as a quick, you know, rapid fire type of, you know, uh, questions. So the first one, it's April, and you want to know. For climate land, what is the expected of the the outcome of the rainy season, July through September? What is the forecast that you would use? Seasonal, the first one, right? So that's the right answer. That's you know around April. That's when you start receiving this seasonal forecast covering the three months of the uh, of the rainy season. So yeah, that's good one. And then of course you can in your interpretation you can also like look at what, what are the ENSO projections, but as we have seen, if you have the seasonal that takes into account all these different factors, that would be your best choice. 
Second one, it's April and now, um, no, wait, 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 no. So now you're asked to be, to assess whether a specific village, so we're talking about, you know, one little village um, in climate land will be impacted by a dry spell in the next 10 days. So we're talking about something that is, you know, very localized and, you know, in the near future, short range. That's what I see in the, in the, um, in the chat. Exactly. So that's where you want to have high temporal and spatial resolution, because we're talking about a village and we're talking about 10 days. Next one is February. And now you would like to know how many millimeters of rain are expected in on the 15th of August. So really early in February, you want to know, you know, on the 15th of August, so like five and a half months away, the number of millimeters of rain. Is it something we can predict at all? So the answer, and that was actually in the uh, one of the options in the uh, in the poll, is no. This is, you know, unfortunately not something that you know, despite the great efforts of climate scientists, is possible to predict for now. So because this is too far away, too specific in terms of temporal resolution, and the lead time is too much. Last one is February, but and you want to know the overall climate trend for the next 10 years in climate land, what projections or, uh, or predictions you would be using? Climate projections, exactly. So this is where we really look at long-term trends and patterns, and that's sort of like the type of you know, information that you can provide and the time horizon of these projections. So we are a little, you know, one minute over time. So thank you so much, so much for, you know, engaging in this, uh, um, you know, with us in this webinar. Uh, we'll send a follow up with much more details, the slides. And then, of course, I mean, this is also meant to be, um, uh, you know, the beginning of a, a constructive exchange between uh, the climate science community and the humanitarian community. So please be in touch and uh, thank you very much, Stefan, for being with us uh, today. I think it's, you know, it's really amazing to have, you know, this opportunity, especially for, you know, some of the people working in the humanitarian sector to really um, hear directly from you and to ask questions. So thank you so much. And we'll be in touch very soon. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or comments or feedback. And I'll also uh, invite you to join the next webinar on the 20th on flood forecasting. Thank you very much. Thanks all.